My name is Lisa Kemmerer, and I'm with Montana State University, where I teach philosophy and religions. I'm going to go through a presentation where I'm going to ask you some questions. I have a sh we don't have a lot of time, so you have to kind of fire out your answers quickly. And if you're a, some kind of religious authority, whether you're a rabbi or a priest or a minister or something, please don't answer. Let's leave this for the others. So how many of you have given a, an effort to give information and talk to people, and at the end of it they say, i got to give a little bit of hamburger? Yeah. How many of you have had that experience? All right, we'll get back to that. I want to give you a presentation kind of like I deal with when I talk to people who are either Christians or Jewish. So, um, as I say, just fire out the answers. What was created on the sixth day? Okay, good. On the fifth day, there were fish and birds. On the sixth day, we had all of the animals, land animals, including human beings. Let's see how else you do here. What does God say is good? Yes. Every living, every living thing is said to be good, actually, to be more precise. Who is told to be fruitful and multiply? Every living thing. Good. Okay, so who is given the breath of life? All right, now here we start to get a little tricky. The answer is every living thing, but in the English translations, the way they've been done, if you're talking about something that's not a human, you get living creature. But that's a translation. Uh, in the original, the breath of life is given the same to all living beings. And Ecclesiastes, of course, backs this up. They all have the same breath, of, and, and humans have no advantage over the animals. Ecclesiastes is one of my favorite books. What are humans given dominion over? Earth, the animals, okay. And the answer is the animals, the living, the things that move. All right, so I think the more relevant question here is what are we not given dominion over? The elements, Everything, right? The trees, the water, the rocks, the earth itself. We are not given dominion over. Who is created in the image of God? Humans. Now this one's easy. My students always get this one right. Usually all the previous ones they get wrong. But this one, they know. Alright, so but the question then becomes, what does it mean, the image of God? So scholars generally say that what this means to be created in the image of God is that you have something, that there's something of God in humanity. So what this is interpreted to mean is that this compassion, the mercy, the justice, the wisdom, that these elements of the divine are also in humanity. In ancient Egypt, we can look for more information on that, down through history, when things that were created in the image of God, what this meant was that we were to be caretakers, to act as the divine in the divine's absence. So it's a form of service, a godlike service to creation. That is what is interpreted to mean by scholars to be created in the image of God. What are humans given to eat? You guys are so much more educated than my students. It's wonderful. So here is what is written. Um, the plants, yes, are given as food. Every plant yielding seed and every tree with seed. So what's interesting is, yes, we're given dominion. It's a vegan dominion. So we don't have dominion over the earth. We do have dominion over the animals, but we can't eat them. No eating them. All right, there's more to how we're to treat them here. Now, People who are adamant to continue their habits are likely to refer to Genesis 9, 9 3 to be exact, where God is frustrated with the violence. You have to see this in the context in order to respond to people who refer to Genesis 9. So, the story is around Genesis 6, due to the violence and corruption of humanity, the Creator is so tired of people that the decision is to flood them out and get rid of them. So, there's a lot of unhappiness with the way humans behave. And then, uh, when we get to Genesis 9, it says, the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon the earth. So this is not a happy moment. This is not the original creation that we see in Genesis 1 and 2, which we've talked about, where a vegan world is created. This is a very changed world. So anyone of faith who turns to Genesis 9, if you point this out to them, it's, a, it's disingenuous to 
suggest that somehow this is what is intended or wanted. And you can also look, of course, to the Peaceable Kingdom, which is brought up later. Um, and when you, sh if you, I always in all of my classes and what I'm doing with students officially, they have to look at undercover footage so they can't deny what's really going on. And in, the, in light of both what they know now about the food industry or the circus or vivisection, and what they hear in just Genesis 1 and 2 is all I'm looking at, uh, it becomes clear that Genesis 9 isn't really what matters here. This is not the original plan. This is not what's intended. So then we turn to Genesis 2 to find out what our duty is. So we're told to till and keep. And when you look at these words and how they're used in other portions of the Bible, what they general, generally mean, it is to serve and protect. Serve and protect. So that is what humanity is put on the earth for, is to serve and protect. Just a couple of more things that I like to bring up. Who's made as a helpmate? Women. Oh, okay. Your significant other. The truth. <laughs> You know, scripturally, here it is, and I actually included this one because I figured you would not quite know what the answer was. The truth is all the animals are created for this purpose, and then woman. So isn't that interesting? Doesn't that change uh, how we look at what we are here for? To serve and protect, apparently, all the animals and woman and man are here to serve and protect. Who does God make, the last question, who does God make a covenant with? And this one I really like, every living creature and the earth itself. And this is Adam, it's, it's something like five times in the, in the Rainbow Covenant. The many, many times that this is stressed, that this is with all living creatures and the earth itself. Again, a very important point. All right, so here's a summary of what we've looked at. Again, this is just Genesis 1 and 2. We're just getting started to look at what the rich text here and how we can explore it when we're talking about animals and how they ought to be treated. The New Testament, I'm not going to take a lot of time on this, but I just want to add to the, just looking carefully at the first two chapters of Genesis, I want to add some of the key subjects from the New Testament. So what's the fundamental teaching? What would you say? Treat others how you want to be treated. If I wait long enough, usually what comes out, and these are good answers that you've given, is love. And this quote, of course, is one of the best ones. Um, <laughs> Love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The beautiful quotes, strong quotes on love. And again, relating this to uh, what's actually going on in the world. Other key ideas, mercy, service, that we are here not for ourselves, but to be of service to those in need, those in need whoever is in need, that we are to live a life that is centered around God. It's not about us, it's not about our taste buds or our fashions or how we can keep ourselves as long, alive as long as possible. That's not what we're here for. We're here as a God-centered life, as service. And peace is what, one of the key ideas of what we are to establish here on earth, that it is to be on earth as it is in heaven, that we are called to bring back the peaceable kingdom. And of course, most of you probably know, if you don't know anything else the Bible, about the Bible, many people know something of the writings of the Peaceable Kingdom because they are so beautiful. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain. So, we come back to the hamburger. So, I just want to tell you that when I'm doing advocacy, I have never had a person of faith say this to me. Never. It is only secular people that will say this. And there's a key here. There's something important here to be noticed. That people of, who are committed to a religion can't say this. Why? Do you get why? It's hypocrisy. It's like saying, I don't care what the scriptures say. I don't care what's intended to me. I don't care about mercy and service and love. I don't care what I was given to be eaten. I don't care about the suffering of animals. I have never had a Christian or anyone else of faith say that to me nor do I ever, ever expect them to. And if they do, they're not really committed. So this is a really important bit of information for us as advocates. So why do any Christians defend current animal exploitation? It's simple. We're not doing our job. I've heard it again and again at this conference. I'm not religious, why would I go to that panel? 
I'm not religious. Why would I read that book? Why would I know about scripture? Well, why? It's like saying, I don't eat meat. Why would I talk to a meat eater? You know, it's, it misses the point, right? You would talk to them because you have a different idea and you want to share that idea. So that is what's important about this panel. That is what is important about us knowing something about scripture. It isn't about what you believe. This isn't about us. It never has been. It's about the suffering. It's about other animals. It's about bringing change. And the only way we can do that is to understand, if we're dealing with people of faith, we have to understand what they believe. And if you understand that and are sincere and honest in approaching them, have some respect for what they believe. It is amazing what you can do. As I say, they will never say, well, I better go get me a hamburger. My work as advocacy as a teacher is much more effective with people of faith. And that's why they're called to care.